So that was a wonderful performance of dance we just saw. And uh, uh, my, my uh, presentation will also be about something that's uh, normally silent, I guess, <laughs> rather than um, music. And this is about uh, solving problems in, in some new ways. Um, and I call some of these way, ways live solving. Uh, here's an outline for what I'm planning to present to you. Uh, a brief introduction with a, a video uh, that I found on YouTube that just fit, fit the theme perfectly. Uh, a brief introduction to the classical theory of problem solving. Uh, I hope I have time for all this. <laughs> and a, a brief review of a system we developed called CoSolve. And then, and then I want to talk about the actual subject matter of live solving. Which, uh, which, of which I'm offering several different types, but I'm really going to focus on one of those types that I, that, that's drawing the, the paths that represent solutions to a problem. Uh, and then some discussion and so forth. So here's the video to kind of introduce this topic. Um, I met Mr. Rubik uh, about three months ago in Budapest, and, uh, and so uh, I, I realized how how much of an inspiration he has been to the world. So th these young people are solving Rubik's Cube problems uh, as a performance, as a c in competition on this stage. So this is a type of problem solving that is performance oriented. Okay, so uh, <laughs> the, the, point, the point of this is that um, we don't always solve problems simply because we want the solution. Sometimes the process of solving the problem is the, <laughs> is the end goal. And um, uh, so I want to talk about that process and uh, kind of show its similarities to live coding and also present a particular technique that, um, uh, that I'm presenting here for the first time. Before I do that, though, I want to uh, base the particular kind of problem solving in a theory. I call it the classical theory of problem solving. Uh, it's perhaps better known in AI as state-space search-based problem solving and uh, kind of goes back many years to uh, some work done by Newell and Simon on a system called the general problem solver. Once again, I'm showing you my age because I was actually alive when the system was created in the late 1950s. <laughs> um, but here's, the, here's a, uh, a little bit of theory. I know m perhaps this is not the right place to show mathematics, but uh, there's not much of this. But if we describe our problem in terms of three components, a starting state, uh, a set of operators which represent methods that can be applied to transform the state, and then uh, an indication of what a goal uh, represents some kind of predicate uh, that can be applied to a state to tell you if it's a, it's a goal, then we have a problem that we can solve using this particular methodology that some people call state-space search. Each of the operators or methods that can be applied to transform the state has two parts. It has a, uh, a precondition, which is uh, a condition under which it can be applied. So it's a, you can test a state and say, okay, yeah, we can apply this operator. We're allowed to make this move, et cetera. Uh, it, it has another part which actually transform the state, transforms the state assuming that it's, it's uh, uh, applicable. Uh, these implicitly define a set of possible states, the set of all reachable states from the initial state by applying over and over again members of the set of operat operators. So the sigma represents this state space or problem space as uh, some people call it. So here's a sort of diagrammatic representation of the problem space with the initial state sigma sub naught up, up at the top and then uh, perhaps, perhaps it's uh, tree structured because at each 
state, we can apply uh, a finite set of operators. It might not actually be finite. We might have parameters where we can have uh, floating point values and so forth for these parameters. But in any case, we have this, this state space that's defined. For example, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Towers of Hanoi puzzle here? Okay, probably at least half of you. It's commonly taught in computer science classes. It's this puzzle where we have uh, three pegs and, and a, a pile of disks on the first peg. And by moving these uh, disks from left to right and sometimes right to left, we have to get all of the uh, disks piled up on the, on the third peg. Uh, and you're not allowed to put a large disk on a small disk, etc. So there are com some constraints. In this situation, the initial state is diagrammed like that. And then we have a set of six operators, in this case, move from, one, from, from pe uh, peg one to peg two, move from one to three, et cetera. And the set of uh, goal states is just this single uh, set sigma. So uh, that's an example of how the, the definition of a problem uh, plays out for one particular well-known puzzle. So here's uh, the system COSOLVE that we built to kind of explore collaborative, deliberative um, problem solving with this theory. So instead of having an agent, a computer agent doing the solving, it's humans that do it and do it in a collaborative web-based environment. Um, uh, it, it was a successor to a system called T-Star that was uh, done in Python as a sort of single user system with the possibility to share trees and so forth. Um, so CoSolve kind of took that transparent state space search approach and put it on the web. So let me show you uh, a quick video uh, of some CoSolve activity. This was done by my former PhD student, Sandra Fan, who's now at Google, um, working on other web-based things. Uh, but in this particular situation, we see two solvers uh, operating in the same solving session, starting with an initial state for the Towers of Hanoi problem with three, this is a version with three disks, and Sandra is uh, moving some disks from left to right, um, but as people typically find early on when they're trying to solve this puzzle, uh, you get stuck if you just always try to move things from left to right. And so in the meantime, oh, here she is annotating a, a state where she says, oh, I got stuck, this was not so great. But in the meantime, I've been editing this other uh, <coughs> branch of the tree and uh, collaboratively, we uh, decide that this is a better approach and so forth. So uh, this was CoSolve, um, but we f I found <laughs> that the, the amount of latency in applying operators in CoSolve was frustratingly high. And uh, I was looking for an alternative way to kind of create a problem solving experience for users that would be a little bit more that, like that sort of very live kind of solving we saw in the video. Um, so let me show you this first form of uh, live solving, uh, which is uh, using sort of drawing gestures to, to move through the space of possible states, the state space in order to, uh, to possibly generate a solution or, to, or perhaps just to explore the space. Uh, normally, one sort of looks at a state and figures out uh, what the possible moves are and then uh, makes the move and so forth. But in this environment, we're going to use the, uh, the state space graph, the problem space graph, as a representation for actually interacting with the puzzle. So in this example, uh, we've got the Towers of Hanoi with some number. This is not actually accurate because there would be many more states if <laughs> we actually um, took, uh, took all of them for this particular version. So the start state has been set up over here in the lower left corner. Uh, the goal state is the lower right. And then there's this intermediate state, which is sort of notable because it's very much like the, the other two, but it has all of the disks piled up in the middle. And th these sort of, s these states span this, or sort of anchor this, uh, this graph that's laid out in a particular way that I'll talk about later. And uh, let me see if I can now bring up the demo here. If I can find it, I think it's in here. Oops, sorry, that's not it. Must be in here. Uh, okay, here it is. 
So in my live towers of Hanoi here, what I have is the state space graph on the left and the particular state we're looking at, and this is the initial state on the right. And if I just sort of move the mouse over the, the, the edges of the graph, I am tracing out uh, a path in the graph and at the same time making the moves of uh, in the Towers of Hanoi. So let's see. Is this, is this going anywhere? Not clear, but that's all right. So I am, this is what I'm calling the first form of live solving, where uh, through this process, and this particular graph has been pre-computed, uh, but one could well imagine that the graph is being computed as, uh, as I move through the space, so that in some sense it could be live at level five, where it's anticipating possible uh, continuations of, a, of the solution path and then offering these continuations. Oh, I have to back up here. Obviously got, got to a dead end. And uh, <coughs> so, so this is an example of an error in solving that becomes part of my performance. <laughs> Just to carry on the theme that we mentioned this morning where if you make an error, uh, it should be part of the narrative. Uh, <laughs> for the performance to be successful. So I am improvising here and making, making mistakes perhaps on purpose. Uh, let's see, where, where should I really go? I probably should have gone this way, right? It's, it might have been possible to get out of that, but uh, okay. Actually, I, I don't need to go through the rest of it. <laughs> All right, let me go back to Keynote. Um, so one of the challenges of making this available is to come up with an appropriate uh, graph layout that, that has the right sort of affordances for drawing on it. You don't want states piling up on each other and you want them spread out, you want them arranged in some intuitive fashion. And so you've got to come up with some sort of mapping uh, that takes a set of states and puts them into the plane or perhaps into a three-dimensional space. You might also want to uh, render each state with a little graphic instead of just a circle um, so that there's a little bit more sense of orientation within the graph. Um, so, so clearly one of the challenges of providing this sort of facility is coming up with those visualizations. Um, uh, they have a number of advantages besides supporting the live solving. They, uh, they give you uh, a shared representation. You can have multiple people looking at this representation, perhaps drawing different parts of the graph, and uh, a, a basis for communication. Th I'd like to show you one other example. This is the missionaries and cannibals puzzle, just to uh, show that the methodology isn't completely limited to one problem. Uh, I need to go back again. Whoops, sorry, that's not it. MC. So in this particular uh, puzzle, the goal is to get all of the missionaries and cannibals across the river um, subject to some constraints. One is that there has to be a missionary that uh, steers the boat, uh, at most three people in the boat. Um, we must never allow the missionaries to be outnumbered by the cannibals, either on the left bank, the right bank, or in the boat because disaster will strike missionaries get eaten, or if you prefer the politically correct version, the other way around, uh, we should never allow the cannibals uh, to be outnumbered by the missionaries for fear that they would be converted. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> but whatever your version is, uh, <laughs> this methodology should be applicable. Okay. So, uh, you know, one of the challenge challenges in this, in this particular problem, again, is that you sometimes have to do counterintuitive things, sort of moving backwards in whatever space that you, you've used to lay out uh, the states. And in this case where we uh, have sort of progress for the missionaries on the x-axis and progress for the cannibals on the y-axis, sometimes we have to move people back in order to uh, make it all the way across. So uh, there's, there's a solution. One of the challenges of the visualization is that the uh, the, using only those two attributes, numbers of missionaries and cannibals, uh, there are states that really should be separate that would otherwise pile up on top of each other and make it difficult to specify the path. So uh, we have to have 
other criteria or, or perturbations or something to, to uh, avoid those collisions. Okay. So uh, back to Keynote and um, the method used to generate this particular visualization was a bit different from that used for the Towers of Hanoi. Here we had two independent heuristics used as uh, ax uh, the values were uh, placed on axes that gave us a way to span our problem space. Um, and uh, this is just a, n an example of uh, another way of doing things, whereas the Towers of Hanoi approach was using landmark states plus a certain kind of distance metric uh, that could allow you to uh, find a distance between two states, especially uh, an arbitrary state and the landmark states, and then use sort of generalized barycentric coordinates to place every state in, uh, on, the, on the plane. And I won't go through all the details here of doing that, but uh, this approach could be extended for other problems. Uh, oh, here's, here's a point, which is if you change the distance function you're using, the solving experience can change quite a bit. So the golden path here shows the optimal solution path, but now instead of using a sort of uh, weighted distance based on how many disks are different and how big they are, we're simply counting the number of moves from the goal and, and from, from the initial state as the distance, and then suddenly the graph that we get uh, uses a straight line for the golden solution path. Um, one more example, this is also using the landmark uh, uh, method of layout where we have, uh, this is the famous blocks world program or problem sometimes used in artificial intelligence courses where there's a pile of blocks, C, B, A, and with these basic moves, we have to, a robot is supposed to uh, get them piled up A, B, C, and, uh, and you're only allowed to pick up one block and put it down and so forth. Um, and this is a graph you could get for that, but it also suffers from potential collisions in layout. Um, other ways of laying out spaces have been suggested by people like uh, Pu and Lalan at uh, Lausanne, Switzerland where they uh, plot state spaces by uh, doing uh, partial breadth-first searches and so forth. Um, there are a bunch of other forms of live solving that I won't talk about today. They're in the paper, and anyone who's interested can take a look there. But I want to kind of close out by talking about the question that people often ask, well, is this stuff any good for real problems instead of just puzzles? And uh, I'd like to claim the answer is yes, because it gives you ways of thinking about these real problems, even if you don't find the solution that you want. But, uh, you know, a good problem is, uh, oops, I need to skip ahead here. Um, sorry. Um, all right. Uh, could live solving contribute to the solution of a significant problem? And What's a, what's a good example of a significant, say, wicked problem? Um, one is climate change. <laughs> There's a tough problem, right? So uh, why is it difficult? It's multidimensional. There are lots of issues. People have uh, incentives to impede the solution <laughs> to the problem or deny that it exists. Um, but there's plenty of evidence that it does exist. and. Uh, what can we do about it? Can we, can we bring technologies like these to, uh, like live solving and so forth, to such a problem? And I'd like to argue, yes, if you at least uh, focus on key aspects of a problem like this, like the basic physics of, uh, of heat, uh, you can get something to work with and express it in a way that people can start to think about uh, the, the solution to the problem in a systematic way. So here's uh, the irradi black body radiation equilibrium equation, solve it for T, and then uh, a a this is the physics part of it. Then this is sort of a fictional part of it where we create these uh, imaginary operators <laughs> that might actually do something to change uh, the situation. And there's lots of uh, other literature about how you create those things um, related to game design and modeling and so forth. Um, but in this particular example, uh, there, I did an implementation in T-Star and then later did a visualization. I don't have an actual live version of this. One of the challenges is the layout. Okay, here's the layout we get by uh, using the second approach that I showed you to laying out where we take two particular heuristics or two particular variables in the model 
in this case time on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis, something I think we can all relate to. The problem, by the way, here is to start in 2015 and to make it to 2050, keeping the average uh, temperature of the Earth uh, below uh, 20 degrees C, I think it is. And it's quite difficult, but it's possible in this particular formulation of a problem. But, but live solving in this, in this particular example would take more than simply the drawing affordances that I showed you because of the overlap. So we need ways of, of either, you know, navigating in, a, in three dimensions or higher dimensions in order just to specify the particular states that we'd like to. But um, that's future work. Conclusions. Interactive computing offers new ways to mediate problem solving. The classical theory offers one particular approach that can help ground some of these, these things. Uh, live solving methods can reduce the latency between uh, user problem solving intentions and the system responses. And I hope or I, I'd like to believe that live solving has some potential as a performance activity as well as a way to help people improve their problem solving abilities. So uh, I'll use QED, <laughs> so, not that I've solved the problem, but <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you to uh, all, all of you people. So we'll take a question or two while our next speaker is set up. Thank you very much, Steve. Do we have a question? Yeah, please. Uh, just wondering which problem you think people are trying to solve Well, one, one, <laughs> one problem is, you know, uh, like Sam was doing last night, he was trying to get people to dance. And uh, uh, I don't know if he was, that wasn't a prob big problem, but um, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you solve it by trying different things. And, uh, and you try them perhaps in some systematic way. And that's, that's, that's certainly a performance-related problem of trying to get the audience to respond in a particular way. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I'm being a bit facetious, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other questions? Well, is there another way of looking at it and think that the, the live coder might want to think of the, the problem as something that they established beforehand, and then the... Just show the top bit first, and I don't show the bottom bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Is that one of your implications? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I had a C-star formulation or uh, a musical composition problem, which I uh, don't have time to show you, but uh, certainly a composition problem can be thought of as, you know, an arrangement of components yeah. that you could use a framework like yeah. this for. But it could be any problem for you, and still potentially, as in sonification, be interesting. Yeah. Okay. Just totally crashed, I'm afraid. Oh, God. Uh, oh, no. Uh, no. <laughs> I know it is now, but that's but because that's I reloaded it. Drop that out, and what's left is, is an exploratory framework. And so, if you have a bunch of uh, sonic uh. affordances that you'd like to explore, this framework could help you do that. Um, so you don't have to have a goal. A lot of design problems don't have any clear goal, except perhaps set a criteria that you'd like to kind of satisfy, as they say, which means you know not okay. compromise but do reasonably well. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> All my windows are absolutely crap. Oh, shit. Okay, thank you very much. So, now I think we'll move on to... Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
live coding. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so we decided we're not going to do the dead mouse thing here, where uh, you just press play and everything goes smoothly. Sam said, no, don't use PowerPoint. Uh, so I've coded up our presentation slides in my live visual coding language. So it crashed uh, as soon as we went on stage. Uh, and you may or may not see the talk we planned. Fortunately, we don't have anything very complicated to say. Uh, so <laughs> we'll just deal with the software as it goes. So um, we're interested in practice-based, practice-led research, and particularly interested in the, the question of craft. Uh, fortunately, everything I'm about to say, Jeff Cox said much more articulately in the previous paper session. So I'm just saying the same things as his, him, but with, with simpler pictures. Um, and I should say this is drawing on work from eight years ago with Sally Jane Norman, which is amazing that she's here uh, as, the, uh, as our keynote for tomorrow morning. But Jeff didn't have a chance of it crashing there, did he? So there's a uh, risk. Oh, that's, that's true. This is riskier, <laughs> than, riskier than Jeff's talk. <laughs> so, um, so what's special about doing practice-based research. And the problem is, as Jeff said, it's a problem of epistemology, what goes inside of our head. Um, and this kind of practice-based craft, I mean, there's a craft, that's sculpture. Our claim here is that live coding is a kind of craft too. Um, and in particular, the relationship that we have with our tools is like the relationship that craft researchers have with their tools. That's what we're really talking about. So this sculptor has got a chisel in their hand. The sort of knowledge that we produce, um, and it's basically like we've got a hand in our head. Uh, so how does the <laughs> I told him he should have looked at this before we gave the talk. <laughs> so, so, so we're constructing knowledge that we gain through our hands, and somehow we have to articulate it. It's in our heads. Um, there are other crafts that are far better discussed than, than live coding, crafts like knitting, for example. So, uh, so here we have knowledge that we're constructing in our hands. Um, and Alex has done some wonderful work, both with weavers and with knitters. Um, so, oh, it's good he's arrived now. Because he hasn't, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we're constructing, we're building a structure in our hands. And those things I said yesterday about experience, um, they really, they're, they're made physical in, in craft. But the problem is turning this into knowledge because, um, oops, we crashed. Oop, <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you've just got a big tangle, you look at what you've made uh, and where did the knowledge go, the stuff that's in your hands? So, so this is the question for our paper really, is how do you get knowledge out of craft-based, practice-led research? Um, well, we have an answer for you, of course, uh, to the big question, uh, and I just press play. <laughs> that's, that's the answer, is that we are <laughs> looking for some kind of rigor. Um, that's the difference between just doing craft and doing research and craft, is that we have to have a process of structuring it and formalizing it, a, a way that we can talk about it in a rigorous way. And that's why you would do it in a university rather than just doing it in, on stage or in your craft workshop. So uh, what does that look like? Uh, I just have to get past a bunch of other stuff here that generated that amazing yeah, animation. That rigor in <laughs> level here. That's right. <laughs> OK, so here is the rest of the talk. Um, the structure is basically this. that. Um, we have some, rigor consists of four things we're, we're claiming. First, an awareness of the, the previous work um, from which uh, your own craft interventions are inspired. Secondly, having critical questions in relation to that previous work. Uh, so you just don't simply forge ahead, uh, you forge ahead with reasons. Thirdly, we claim that the kind of tool making we do is an essential aspect of our craft um, and that exploratory implementation, uh, as an engineer might call it, or hacking, as many of us have called it during this workshop, uh, is essential. Um, and then finally, um, being reflective uh, and thinking, using our making as a basis for thinking. So with some more cunning plans, we can move out of that mode and deal with the first one first, previous exemplars. And here's a chance for Sam to say something. Hi. Um, 
And here we're talking about overtone and Andrew Sorensen's extempore. Yeah. So uh, we're trying to find an example of these things is, is interesting. So here's, the, here's an example that I was quite pleased about because it, it's, uh, it allowed me to express something which I was trying to express for a while, which is uh, Steve Reich's piano phases. Does anyone, everyone know what they are? So if I play a, a, a simple pattern of notes, so here's my notes here, E up to 4, F sharp, 4, B4, etc. If I play them one after another and then repeat, that's one person. If the other person plays the same notes but just slightly faster or just slightly slower, they'll start sounding like they're playing at the same time, but they'll go out of phase and then back in phase one note off and then round and round and round to eventually they come back to the same point again. And so this implementation uh, expresses exactly that in code. And I was really excited because because it, it, it used uh, this idea of this sort of temporal recursion. So Andrew talked about this uh, at length in previous papers, but the, the idea was lovely. But it's one of those ideas where you have to really sort of sit like this for a while. And think, I wonder how that works. You know, how does it actually work? So I've got a function, and I'm taking parameters, and I'm destructuring the parameters, and I'm doing like an uh, if statement here. If some condition is true, like if I have a note to play, then schedule it to play in the future. So this notion of scheduling. And this is the really weird bit, right? So then the function asks, asks itself to be called in the future when it needs to play the next note. So it's in, it's in charge of scheduling itself. So here's a bunch of machinery which happens, which does this. Uh, and then here we say, well, let's actually let's fire two of these guys off and fire them with a very, just slightly different time between the notes. That's your tempo. And off it goes. And it's lovely. So this is like the prior work for the Sonic Pi work. So this is my overtone thing, but again, itself taking off ideas from Andrew's work. So I'm thinking, how do I actually make this simpler? Is it possible to make this simpler? Like, mathematically, that's quite nice, easy. So the Sonic Pi solution, great reveal, is this. <laughs> right? So we have the same thing, we've got the notes here. But instead of doing all this recursion and uh, scheduling and stuff, we just have like an iterative solution. We have two live loops, which are just playing with slightly different times, and they're ticking through the notes. I'm even able to actually specify it's going to be a short note. Uh, so you don't even need these bits here. That's just for aesthetic prettiness. Um, and so again, like, it's about trying to, to uh, take these uh, previous ideas, understand them, and figure out how we can rewrite them and rework them in ways that, that, that fit our challenges, which is what we're going to talk about next. OK. Next. <laughs> the critical <laughs> questions. <Yeah>. So... <laughs> <laughs> and here, Sam is going to uh, <laughs> describe well, what, actually, what critical questions arise in the making of Sonic Pi. Yeah, so I mean, I, I could only, before I talk about Sonic, use oh, Sonic Pi, yeah. like, actually, you already used the, where are we? Uh, oh, no. No. Where's the, uh, where's that web page gone? Don't, oh, I just closed it. Oh, okay, right. So, <laughs> the thing about the why I was doing everything the, the, the last... Oh, you want to get it back? It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's matter. Okay. It works, right, hi? Um, <laughs> so, the, 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 the critical goal there was to ensure that every aspect in the, in the second solution, I can imagine teaching to a 10-year-old. That was like a fundamental question. I, I, I wasn't going to put any features, and I don't put any features into Sonic Pi, unless I can imagine teaching to a 10-year-old. And that... That concept is something which I've got through a lot of experience going into schools. So I'm not necessarily like the world's expert on 10-year-olds, but have a, have a general test that sort of works. And so all the concepts in there pass that test, whereas the overtone solution and the, the extemporary solution, for me, don't pass that test. I still struggle to imagine how to teach those concepts to 10-year-olds, and let alone myself. Um, and so what am, I, what am I talking about now? I've got Sonic Pi. I can make a tune. Yeah. So I think you were going to say something about... Um, <laughs> How the challenge, how you've, you've architected this language. Yeah, okay, so uh, you've got a weird keyboard layout now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this system, the whole, uh, how long do you want to talk about this for then? So, two uh, this system, yes. the whole thing is about being really simple and about demonstrating this, this, the simplicity of these things, the critical challenge is communicating these things. So, the, the operations at the top are very simple, very bold, very obvious. This pre preferences thing is by default is hidden. And then you've got two things, you've got text to put in and words to put out. And then the goal is, again, like what's the simplest thing you can teach to a 10-year-old? And how do you actually also, actually, what's the simplest thing you can teach your teacher? That's even harder. Um, <laughs> and so the first program you write in Sonic Pi is the word play, and then a note, and then you run, and you hear a beep. And it's not very loud, but there we are. Oh, and so, again, oh. this fits those exact same criteria. So, oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, that was excellent. 
that's exciting. Um, so the goal here is like, uh, what is a way to express the first program you could write that would make it an output that you'd actually engage with and understand and appreciate and also be able to tweak and play with. And this is the first program you'd write. You'd write the word play and then the notes. And then you don't even think about it in the notes, you're talking about those numbers and you can talk about the fact they can go up. So 80 and down and off they go. Oh. And well, yeah. that's fine, yeah, we can hear that. And then we'd also talk about the fact that if we want to play a chord, we actually play these things at the same time. Oh, so okay. this is actually non-obvious to a lot of people, but it's, it's there because we're actually changing the way the programming language works a little bit. Here, but we've got no time in between these two things, so it's actually played at the same time, like notes and a chord. And so we need one more bit of semantics to describe melodies, and that's sleep. So I'm going to sleep for half a second, play that note, and sleep for a second, and play that note. And again here, we have this ability to express most of Western notation with just two commands, which is pretty cool. Um, do you want me to say anything else, like structurally, or? I, mean, I, I think you have time to say something else. If you, or, or yeah, I, yeah. And then, okay, so the, 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 the other thing, the, the final thing was that, um, this is also specifically for teaching and computing curriculum, but we soon realised it's much more than that. It's much more fun to play and to, to make music. And so one of the goals was to how use the computing co constructs to be able to do, in, do interesting things. So loops are obviously quite useful because I can sort of get this thing and, and repeat it forever, right? And that's how we can make dance music, that's all that is. Uh, I just replace that with drums. Um, but the problem with that, though, is that once I've got a loop, there's like black holes, you know, they, they don't allow you to modify them. They just, the, the control flow stays in there until you stop it. And so, uh, again, a, a, an interesting thing is to think about how can we make something which is as simple as a loop, but also offers a really interesting, sophisticated interaction uh, uh, sort of paradigm, which is this that notion of live coding, which is why we're all here. So how do we turn that into a live coding thing? Well, I could use a temporal recursion kind of thing, uh, which is what Overtone did, but I invented this thing called the live loop. And uh, you just put the word live in front of it, because that's what we're doing, and give it a name, Bob, right? or like uh, uh, Rachel. And then, and it's cool, right? Because actually, you can explain this to really kids really easy. Say, so, well, I've got a band, and I've got a drummer, Rachel, and I've got the guitarist, Joe. Right, so there's Rachel, she's playing the, she's playing the drums, well, actually, she's playing the guitar. And then uh, I've got a Joe playing the drums, And off they go at the same time. So two live loops. Well, th th this notion of a live loop is not more complicated to a ten-year-old to look at than a loop, but actually it's really sophisticated because we've got this notion of concurrency, both of these things happening at the same time. We've got this notion of being able to update them. So whilst they're running, I could ask Joe to play. You're not playing loud enough, Joe. Can you play louder, please? So let's change him to be louder. Well, you're too loud, too loud, too too. Loud. So quieter. So just by changing the parameters, pressing run again. We have this updatable behaviour. Um, and so, and again, this is really easy to explain to 10-year-olds. And I know this because I've gone to schools and they're all doing this. You know, without having been taught, it's just amazing to see. Great. Right. Excellent. Next. <laughs> uh, so our critical questions are about pedagogy, um, about cognition and about uh, curricula uh, and things. So we're going into these things with... Um, with an approach to previous systems like Scratch, Logo. Um, and how do we go about this? We build stuff to see what's going to work. Um, and so the Palimpsest environment that I'm uh, stuck in here is just to prove that I, that I actually coded this stuff uh, somewhere here. Here's a, so here's a, a chunk of Palimpsest code. Um, I spent nearly a year creating it. Uh, so it's implemented in about 60,000 lines of Java. Um, and all implemented in IntelliJ's IDEA environment, uh, which is actually like the kind of craft tool that sculptors have refined over centuries in order to make it easy to get what they want out of stone. So this kind of environment, uh, IntelliJ or Eclipse, if you use that, and these have been crafted by uh, hundreds, thousands of craftspeople, um, showing the way that they think about software and that the way their hands build, bring concepts out. So when I was implementing Palimpsest, um, I let my hands lead me through the implementation of the system, uh, which is why it crashes so much. <laughs> um, uh, but really making a lot of use of uh, the, the tools like refactoring systems. So I would say every class in this whole system changed its name at least once, because it was only two or three weeks after playing it, after writing it two or three months afterwards, 
that it dawned on me after using the system, coding the system, using the system, I think actually, now I understand what that class was. Now that I've been working with it for three months, now I really know what it was I was trying to do in the first place, and the original name was completely wrong. So this is kind of the experience that every hard-working programmer has, is that your concepts arise through working on the code, and it's only over time that, that you really get a refinement of understanding what you're doing. So this is really um, making knowledge through the work of your hands. The final piece is about reflection on practice. Uh, and Sam's going to say a little bit about the way he combines practice with reflection. Yeah, so like the, um, there was a real core cool challenge, actually, when I was working on the overtone, the previous system I was working on with Jeff Rose. I was imagining the most sophisticated system I could possibly build as a programmer, because that would be obviously the key, the right thing to do. What would give me the most power? be able to, to write interesting music and to perform with it and interesting synths. Um, and of course, I mean, let's say what Alan's you were talking about using IntelliJ, I used Emacs and then I modified Emacs myself because I was making my own tools. So I'd get very, and also the tool I was writing to make the music, Overtone, was a tool itself. And so I'd get very lost in the division between the tool I'm using to actually perform with and make music to actually to express myself and the making and the honing and the polishing and the looking after and the cleaning and the the care of the tool itself I'm using to make the tool. And so this, 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 there was this real problem. And so if I was trying to make some music, I'd sit and start making some music, and then I'd go, wow, it'd be really cool if the tool did that. That would be much easier to do. And then I'd go, right, okay, stop making music, start working on that thing. Two hours later, the whole practice session is done, and maybe I've got this thing that I built, often not, and, and I would waste my time. And so what I really did very carefully with Sonic Pi is, is took a very ex extremely different practice, which was, uh, first of all, to, to work on the Raspberry Pi as the performance tool, which meant that I was in a very constrained, limited environment. I really couldn't have, didn't have all the nice uh, editor environment that I would normally have uh, available. I explicitly still to this day don't install those things, even though I could. Um, and just make music with Sonic Pi in the practice sessions. And then, uh, when I have ideas, I have lots of ideas about, oh, I wish it was this was better, I wish that was better. Instead of stopping and working on those ideas, I would just jot them down in a book. So I'd just have a little book next to me, and actually, I'd find if I start practicing and I haven't got the book, I feel a bit anxious, I need the book, because the idea is going to come and I need to write it out very quickly. Um, and so here's, I guess, actually a couple of days ago, I've actually got a book. Before, I was using bits of papers and throwing them away. But now I have a book. Um, and uh, often the ideas don't make much sense when I read them back, and sometimes I can throw them away, and sometimes they make a lot of sense. And so what these tend to do is these tend to feed into the development practice. So the, ne the following day, I'll take these ideas, read through them, scrap most of them, and then take the good ones and then put them into the to-do list to actually implement. And so I would separate my activity between practice, performance, and play, and experimentation, which is specifically in using the tools, to drive this asynchronous list of, of activity then go into the, the, the actual development practice. And that's made a, a huge impact on this. Really something I really recommend people to, to consider doing. It's been, it's been fantastic. So that's uh, our recipe for yeah. um, the way that we cope with the fact that we spend our days basically doing craft. We don't have research questions. We don't have research grants. We just build stuff uh, because it's fun and because we want other people to enjoy it. Uh, and this is kind of how we, we think we turn it into knowledge. So we've got time for a traditional one question and maybe Felian would like to come and get set as well. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Um, practice based research is well established in yeah. lots of disciplines and creative disciplines. And um, there are also good models. So I think recently you might encounter model of research in and through practice, or actually you might even encounter a model of practice as research. So in a way, there's something quite conservative about the practice-based model, but there's yeah. um, you may even get the proposition of an epistemic object. Yeah. Um, so not an object that is translating into knowledge, but an object that is itself knowledge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm curious what you yeah. think. Maybe so we are kind of situated within a specific tradition of practice-based research, which is practice-based design research, mm -hmm. which is actually, a, it's, it's, a, it's a real provocation in the field of human-computer interaction at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and there are major debates in international conferences, and I'm part of those debates. Mm -hmm. um, 
we believe that what we are doing is not necessarily design research. We think we're doing practice-based fine art research, but we're in a technology department. And it's a very strange experience to try and explain to computer scientists why we do the things we do, which actually look incredibly undisciplined. Uh, and we are trying to explain we have a, there's a place for us in computer science. We have a discipline. It's just a different discipline to the one you have. There so, are. for example, in a design environment, the dominant model is a problem-solving model of research. Uh, that's agency. correct, yeah. And in the fine art context, yeah. the dominant model is a question generating yeah. thing. Yeah. And actually, live coding seems to oscillate between the two. Well, I, we, our claim really is craft, craft is it. And this is the paper I wrote with Ali J. Norman, where, where I was trying to make a place for craft as the best model, traditional model, of accounting for what computer people do <laughs> when they're in an arts context. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now we have Feli on copy paste tracking. Hi, my name is Shalina Hermans. I'm an assistant professor at Delft University of Technology and I'm presenting joint work here with Thijs van der Storm at TWA, also in the Netherlands. And many people familiar with my work about spreadsheets were maybe somewhat confused to see me at a conference on live coding. Um, and I'm actually going to argue that spreadsheets are the most important or the biggest success of live programming. So not live coding, but live programming. Because I think this is a distinction and all the material we've seen yesterday was a lot of live coding and today live programming was a little bit more prevalent. And I actually went back to the call for papers to see if I was in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is me uh, on Twitter, by the way, if you're tweeting. So I, it, it wasn't on the website anymore. I asked Alex to put it back <laughs> to look at it. So if you look at the call for papers, it has live programming in it, but specifically in the context of programming languages. So it says live programming languages here, cultural things about live programming languages. And here it's a little bit of a mix between life coding and life programming. It's called life coding before life coding, historical perspective on life programming. So these things seem to be sort of confused. And who was actually at the workshop in San Francisco in 2013? So a few people, I was there too. And their call for papers was also still online. And they made this distinction really, really clear. So this is their website. And they say, this is life programming. So live programming is the idea of abandoning the edit compile run cycle in favor of immediate feedback. So you type something in the computer and you immediately see the response. That's live program. Live coding, on the other hand, are live audio visual performances that use computers as sort of musical instruments. And I think it's important to, to reinstate this de distinction between live coding, which is a performance, and live programming. So I would say this is live coding, and I actually really like Alan's term of yesterday, performance programming as well. You're doing programming as an art form. And this is live programming. So here's a piece of code, and if you change it, immediately the result of the code will update without having to hit compile. And those things are not very different, and in a sense they are related, because suppose I would do live coding, performance programming with a language like Java or C Sharp, or C -sharp it wouldn't be a very nice performance, because every time I would change the code, I would have to hit compile and wait for a very long time. So the liveness of the programming language makes it more practical or useful or appealing as a means of live coding. But those two things are different. And actually, the reviewers don't even know this, because one of the reviewers of my paper said, the authors make a terrific point that spreadsheets are a common form of life coding. I mean, you shouldn't shame reviewers, but I think it's not a form of life coding. Although, it would be interesting to think about how a life coding performance with spreadsheets would look like. Maybe I should submit that next year. But I'm arguing that spreadsheets are life programming. And there are the original live programming, I would say, the most popular. Many people use spreadsheets for all sorts of things, and well, they don't even realize they are programming, so they probably don't realize at all that they are live programming, but, but they are. And the minute you type the formula in, immediately you get the result without 
be added to file cycle. So why do we focus on copy pasting? Because that is what my paper is about, helping people to cope with copy pasting behavior in spreadsheets. So if you look at spreadsheets, this is a typical example where I'm calculating per student uh, the scores for homework and classwork and an exam. There's not really a way that I can repeat this calculation for all of the students. The only way that spreadsheets offer me to do that is by copy pasting the formula. It's even in the interface. So users really rely on copy pasting to make up for the fact that spreadsheets lack abstraction. There's not such thing in a spreadsheet as a student class with a field of homework score and a field of classwork score. I can put my data everywhere, so I really need the copy pasting. Users can do that by dragging a formula down, but it's even more prolific in the user interface because if you click a formula and you double click it, immediately your calculation is repeated. So it's really one of the core ideas of spreadsheet calculation is copy pasting. And probably you've never thought about this, but it's actually pretty magical what happens here because all the formula references are updated automatically and this is also the case if you take a formula and you copy paste it somewhere else in your worksheet all the references are still relative pointing to the same location so this copying is really one of the key ideas within spreadsheets and that's a way that users use to make up for not having classes or fields or higher levels of abstraction but of course, managing clones is really hard, as all sci-fi fans know. As soon as you start copying things, you run the risk that one of your clones, and the whole body of sci-fi work on this, one of the clones is always starting to have bad behavior and rouse up all your nice little plants. So managing the clones is hard, and this exact, this exact same problem happens in spreadsheets as well, and this is not a theoretical problem. And I just not just do this for fun because I'm an academic and I need something to work on. But also that, but it's also a real problem. Here, for instance, a Canadian power company that lost $24 million because a copy-paste error in Excel happened. So this is something that actually happens. People make tiny little mistakes and it's very easy to, to screw up, to, to mess with the interface of copy-paste. So this is exactly the problem that we want to address with the solution that we have made called Xanasheet that remembers what you have copied and updates the copies for you as soon as you edit one. Of course we could, add, we could solve it in a different way. We could ask users to define their data. So we could say, well, you shouldn't do it to a spreadsheet anymore. We, we ask, you have to define this as a student and this is homework and this is classwork that will be a solution. But then this starts to look a lot like access or even like real programming languages. And that, in a sense, would break the spreadsheet. If you introduce abstraction in a more formal way, you take away the, the creativity and the flexibility of a spreadsheet. And this is one of the things that people like about it. They like to be able to put their data anywhere and make a calculation and then just drag it down and change it it doesn't look right, let me do something else. So the, you want to keep the good things, you want to keep the flexibility, not take away the flexibility, but you do want to improve and help people manage the clones. So that's exactly what our solution is about. If you use our plugin and you copy a formula down, then we remember what the origin of the formula is. This is called origin tracking, and this is quite a big field in computer science research. So it also happens in normal programming language where people try to understand what is the origin. So we remember that all these cells were created not by typing, but by dragging the formula down. And then if you want to change one, then automatically all clones will update. So you don't have to define your functions or your abstractions up front, but if you rely on the copying mechanism, we will help you by updating all copies. And of course, that's not always what you want. Sometimes there's this one student that you made an agreement with, yeah, and you know, there's special, a special rule for you because it's the reset from, la reset from last year and you can still have the rules of last year. So what you can do is take a copy, oh wait, this first. 
Anyway, this also works if you have, as I said, if you copy a piece of data twice in the spreadsheet, then the copy tracking also still works. And here it's even more important because if you would change a formula here, you can easily still drag it down. But if you have a formula in multiple places, <laughs> the same one that's representing the same calculation, it will be even more cumbersome to change the formula and drag it down everywhere. Especially if you would have multiple worksheets, if every year I do the same calculation and I want to update it, I would have to go to many different places. So the more clones you have, the more you will benefit from having origin detection. And as I said, sometimes you have this one student where you want to do something different, you can detach your clone from the copy. So in the same fashion that you can take a formula and paste as values, you can also take a formula and separate it from the clone in a new group of itself, and then if you make a change to the clone, it won't change with the other one. So you don't always keep the origin, but we say by default we want to keep the origin tracking because probably if all the formulas are the same, you want to do the same updates to all of the clones. So, the system is improved. We help you make fewer errors by doing origin tracking, but the life properties are not sacrificed. We don't take away from your flexibility, from your ability to just program whatever you want, wherever you want it. We don't add abstraction up front, but we help you maintain clones. And in the context of some life coding languages, what I saw yesterday is many people also rely on copy pasting for a lot of things. Maybe something like Sam just showed, where you have two pieces of code, pieces of sound that you want to keep together. If you would change one, then maybe you want to change the other one as well. So I see that some of the life properties of life coding languages could maybe also benefit from a similar origin detection where you have a piece of music and you want to slow everything down. So you want to remember that this came from the same idea or the same line or the same thought and you want to change everything. Oh, this was actually my final slide already. Right. Yeah. That's it. <laughs>
performing with code and doing it by yourself in the computer. And those, I think, are two. I agree, but I would have like terms be synonymous so instead of the spectrum of libraries. Thank you. Can we just take Alex's comment? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think uh, that there is, there's, I think we're talking about libraries in terms of feedback loops. And there's feedback loops between the programmer and their language. Um, and there's feedback loops between the programmer and the output. And also um, in collaboration with all the performances with the people around. And these are all different kind of interlocked feedback loops. Um, yeah, I, I talked with the email that the organizers of this, um, and they were very accommodating in, uh, <laughs> in uh, sort of, yeah, we've had this negotiation with um, how to fit um, live coding and live programming together, and they ended up writing quite a lot about top flat, which is really kind. Um, but in the end, it seems that it kind of links back to the previous um, talk, really, how um, you start forward as serious in your own domain, and if you're trying to get a grant from computer science and say you're doing live coding, people are going to do a Google search and get all these people done. <laughs> 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 um, so I think this difference between live programming and live coding is social, or um, uh, it's about community, communities, but once we have these different terms, it can divide people. So it's really good that the organizers have been very um, accommodating in connecting with the life Yeah, because this workshop at ICSI was very much about trying to bring these two communities together yeah. to help people that are like coding and thinking about, hey, how does your interface as a programming language look like? And what can you learn from programming language design for life performance and the other way around? Yeah. So that made it yeah. interesting. Yeah, and Brett Victor is the form of his system. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of trying to present yourself to different people in different terms. But yeah, it was quite deliberate using live programming languages because programming and coding, in my view, it's, it's almost a class structure, like programs that don't code. <laughs> 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 but, um, but to me, that's synonymous. But once you say live programming language, it doesn't really make sense to say live coding language. And so mm. that's when you yeah. focus more on the feedback loop between the programmer and the code. It's like programming. Yeah, is it an aspect of the language or is yeah. it what you can do with it, which is a performance? I really like performance programs. Yeah, me too. But I, I agree with both you and Sam, but I think <laughs> we still have need to work out a terminology that works for our yeah. professional lives. I mean, <laughs> the other thing is all of our literature has a confused term. Yeah. 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 To start with. So we, I yeah. mean, every second paper I write, I'll do live programming and live programming. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we're not big. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Last comment. Um, um, so, uh, so I, 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 uh, I was one of the reviewers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> were you a reviewer of three? <laughs> and you proved it because you had a picture of me uh, on the slide. <laughs> so, uh, so actually, I, I, you know, I, we know each other pretty well, uh, so I was being intentionally provocative. I think this is a pretty serious issue for us, and it does relate strongly to the paper I gave yesterday. Alex's uh, point is exactly right, that it's about live feedback with the machine, and it's also about live feedback with other people. So in the work that mm -hmm. uh, Sally Jane and I did, uh, we interviewed some prominent arts programmers, including Nick Rothwell was one of our interviewees, uh, and these people make the point is that they are artists, but they're also se serious engineers. Um, and I would say in this community, we understand the challenges of engineering this stuff, and we also know what it means to give a performance. And we understand that we are performing when we stand up and show people our code. That other community, which some of them have been quite critical of us, actually, uh, in a way that Alex is too polite to mention, but there's been <laughs> some slightly nasty exchanges. Um, that's a community of people who understand engineering, and don't understand that they're giving performances. And you have to ask, I mean, for example, when uh, someone like Brett Victor, who's a celebrity, he's like the Sam Aaron of, um, of live programming languages. <laughs> <laughs> so his videos, he is giving performances. But people speak as though he's just an engineer. And those are performances mm -hmm. just as much as anything we do. And they ought to talk about that, acknowledge it, and think about what the implications are for their research. Yeah, so in a way, I'm quite <laughs> saddened that this this nice mix that we had in San Francisco, we, we software engineers are outnumbered now by the music people, and it's sort of <laughs> sad for my community that we aren't here to learn from what 
this exact mix that you mentioned, yeah, people that understand the two. They're all music. So, why why are you so you've come here, you've given, a great here. you've given a great performance, which is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and in my review comments, what I want to say is, you know, please talk about it. Yeah. I'm pleased you did. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much on this live issue. Let's <laughs> <laughs> thank the students again.